We're interested in understanding how representative a, a single biopsy is of uh, the entire genomic landscape of a tumour. And we're interested in how diversity within the tumour impacts upon survival outcomes and ultimately resistance to therapy. And in, in, in running experiments that we've been doing, trying to understand how tumours adapt and change over time and how therapy might influence that. And so what we're planning going forward is to try to set up longitudinal studies where we're looking at tumours repeatedly during the disease course and understanding how they adapt, how diversity uh, comes about in tumours and overall what the impact of that is on, on outcome. That's certainly what the genomic studies have, have revealed over the last two or three years, that there are differences between the primary tumour and the metastatic site, the differences within a primary tumour and the differences within individual metastasis and between metastasis. And these differences, um, we strongly suspect, are probably likely to contribute to some of the reasons for therapeutic failure in the clinical setting. Well, I mean, if you think about it in ecological terms, diversity is sort of the spice of life. Unfortunately, the same rules probably apply in cancers as well, that the more heterogeneous or diverse a tumour, um, that there is certainly evidence going back at, through the literature in the last 15 years or so, that the more diverse a tumour, the worse the outcome. And I guess that makes sense. The more likely there is to be a resistant clone nestling in a subpopulation of cells that, that when you apply a drug, grows out through therapy in Darwinian um, selective terms how therapy might adapt to the problems of heterogeneity. I think the first thing is that um, the obvious opportunity here is to think about new ways of structuring clinical trials is something we're very interested in. Um, instead of calling an actionable mutation, an action, actionable mutation based on whether it's present in a tumour or not, I think some understanding of whether that actionable mutation is clonally dominant, i.e. is it an early founder event in the growth of the tumour, present in the trunk of the tumour's evolutionary tree, if you like. And I, by um, applying either multi-region sequencing or ultra-deep sequencing analysis, we can start to resolve um, the patterns of mutations within an individual biopsy or between biopsies and actually identify whether those mutations are early founder events or later events in the tumor branches that are present in some subclones but not others or present in some regions of the tumor and not others. And so the obvious you know, study would be to set up a therapeutic study where you um, treat patients based on the ident identification of an actionable somatic mutation and then stratify progression-free survival outcomes based on whether or not that mutation was clonally dominant or not. And, and the hypothesis would be that patients who have the clonally dominant driver mutations that are actionable would do better with a targeted therapy than patients where that actionable event is present in some, sub some cells but not others. Are there any therapies already developed against um, these so-called master regulators, as you put it? And, and I think the answer to that is almost certainly yes. And, and um, if you take, for instance, um, EGFR activating mutations in non-small cell lung cancer, why is it that gefitinib is such an active drug or allotinib is such an active drug in this context? Um, and the hypothesis is for us that, that, those, that the EGFR activating event is an early founder event present in all subclones. And it may well be that the biomarkers that have really stood the test of time are those biomarkers that aren't subject to tumour sampling bias, present in some subclones but not others, but those are the biomarkers that have really validated and qualified for clinical use are the biomarkers that are essentially early founder events present in all cells and therefore represent better drug targets. So we call that inter-tumor heterogeneity. So there's the, the, the gross differences between tumors, genomic differences, and also within individual tumor types we're seeing, you know, take ovarian cancer. There are very few mutations in ovarian cancer that are shared in more than 10% of patients. There's, there's gross um, somatic inter-tumor heterogeneity in many solid tumors with very few mutations being recurrent and present across large proportions of, uh, of patients suffering from that disease subtype. We would like to see clinical trials be structured in this way or some clinical trials be structured in this way to address the relevance of heterogeneity longitudinally in, in prospective studies. And I think it's important to say, though, that, that just by identifying what's going on in the trunk of the tumour, we shouldn't ignore what's, what's going on in the branches too. The diversity, as we mentioned a few minutes ago, is, is also likely to be the reason why the drugs stop working over time because there'll be a subclone of cells, one, one or two cells that will have a particular somatic event that enables them to overcome drug exposure despite the truncal 
actionable mutation present in all cells. There will be a minority populations of cells that hold that actionable event, but also harbor additional somatic changes, mutational changes that allow them to become resistant to drug over time. So in other words, we've got to understand the diversity, I think, as well as understand the, the clonally dominant actionable events too. No, I don't think it's too complicated at all. I think that that is certainly one of the sort of, uh, for us, sort of a holy grail of cancer therapy in a way that we start to preempt what the tumour is about to do next and do it earlier than we would normally be able to do on a CT scan. So, you know, we react to tumours changing in the clinic. I'd like to, like to envisage a future where we proactively manage cancers and block them going down particular evolutionary routes and adding a drug before the tumours had the opportunity to, to adapt through that route and, and evolve down a particular pathway. Um, that's obviously a long way off, it may not be possible, but you know, that, that, that's sort of a future I'd, I'd, I'd be very optimistic about. The, the problem with complexity, the sort of level of complexity we're seeing is it doesn't fit terribly well in a sort of standard pharma business model. This is, you know, the complexity we're all witnessing, not just our labs, but many others um, in both haematological and solid tumours is, is pretty awe-inspiring, I would say, and um, is likely to be very costly to get to grips with. I don't think there's any doubt about that. How we get to grips with it is, is really another matter entirely, and I think we've got to take you know, one step at a time here. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, stratifying patients based on whether the targetable event is clonally dominant or not would be a good place to start. But in due course, I'd like to see greater efforts towards really understanding what's driving diversity in tumours, and that's something our lab is very interested in. We published a paper in Nature um, about a month ago in colo colorectal cancer model showing that a particular region of the genome is consistently lost in diverse colorectal cancers, so-called aneuploid colorectal cancer. And that region of chromosome 18 that's commonly lost in those diverse tumors um, encodes uh, two or three genes um, that act to maintain genome stability. And when they're lost from the cancer genome, you get this, we think, spray of diversity that, that creates we think, um, you know, evolutionary fitness and the power for tumours to adapt. So I think, that for me, that's where I see our lab's future, really understanding how tumours drive diversity, how, diverse, how diversity comes about, what the genetic events are that cause diversity in tumours, and ultimately the goal will be to, to target that and stop it happening, um, or in advance of it happening, or perhaps once it's happened, to try to limit any further diversity from happening by targeting the very processes in the cancer cell that generate um, the heterogeneity.